In this video, we are going to go through the bank reconciliation practice exercise step by step for each of the two parts. Hopefully by now you've had a chance to take a look at this with the template and work it on your own so you can compare it to the actual solution. First of all, part one here is the bank reconciliation itself. We'll see we have a template down below. And part two is going to be for the adjusting journal entries related to the bank reconciliation. So let's take a look down here in the details. We have a list of various transactions that have occurred throughout the month. So we have the cash balance for the company's records as of July 31st was 66955 Now that's just telling us what's referred to as the book side beginning balance. So down here we have the company's book balance before reconciliation. That is going to be that 66955 So as you're working this, first of all, it's important to make sure to get it on the proper side, of course carrying down the proper amount, and making sure it's either positive or negative as a court, as, as it should be. Here in the case of the beginning balance, it's always going to be a beginning positive balance. Bank statement balance as of July 31st was 15875 So now we're over to the bank's cash balance. $15,875. So right off the bat we can tell there's quite a bit of a variance and this is not all that alarming. There may be very good reasons for why there's such a big difference. It's generally going to be all about the time or the timing of various transactions when we find out about it versus when the bank finds out about it. So now if we move down to item number three. A deposit in the amount of $52,000 was deposited in the night depository of the bank on July 31st, but it did not get recorded in the July 31st bank statement balance. So again, the very fact that it was deposited that month would have told us that it would be recorded on the cash balance of the, of the company itself on that day. That's enough to get it recorded in this month we already have it in our records. The bank just doesn't know about it yet. Now that's fine. It doesn't have to hit their cutoff period to be included in our reconciliation. So the cash is valid. It's already on our side. We have to add it in to the bank's side. It won't be on their bank statement balance. So here we have a list of items that we can select from in this particular template. We're going to call this one Deposit in Transit. And the amount is $52,000 that we have to add in. Now we take a look and we see that check number 354 in the amount of 575 and check number 365 in the amount of 1500 were outstanding as of this bank statement. What that means is we've already written the check and we've already recorded it as a cash deduction on our books, but it has not cleared the bank yet. That's why it's still considered outstanding. So it could just be a situation where whoever we wrote the check to just hasn't cashed it yet. So what we're going to do, we could do these as separate entries or we could do them together. We have to record this on the bank side, and we'll see one for outstanding checks. So we're going to include both of those in one line. So 575 and 1500 gives us $2,075. Now we have to subtract this because the cash is actually coming out of the bank. Here we have an NSF check in the amount of $500 written by a customer was returned by the bank to the company in the July 31st bank statement. What that tells us here is this customer wrote us a check and we thought it was good. So we deposited the money in our account. Everything seemed like it was fine. 
the bank did not even deposit the money. They may have done it right away, but they quickly reversed it. So they're telling us the end result in the bank statement, basically the net effect is zero. They never gave us the money. Overall, they did not give us the money. But on our books, we still have $500 in our account that's not really valid. So what we now have to do is take this out of the book side. So we subtract it out of the book side with a $500 deduction. It's cash that's no longer valid. Here we have a bank service charge in the amount of $50 that was included in the July 31st bank statement. The bank is basically telling us that they've already done something. The end balance includes this adjustment. We didn't know about it yet, so now we have to correct for it by subtracting it out of our account. $50. The next one, interest in the amount of 125 was deposited into our account by the bank, is basically the reverse of that. Again, the bank is telling us something. Again, the bank is telling us something that they've deposited 125 into our account. So this is interest earned. We're going to add this to our account. Now this next one is a little bit unusual. You don't see it all that often, but it is in certain problems, certain textbook problems, and certainly in real life as well. Here the bank collected $1,000 from a customer, H. Doe, on our behalf as part of the lockbox service that we established with the bank. This is a situation where certain companies work with their bank, they sign an agreement where the customer will pay, send their payments directly to the bank and the bank will process them and deposit the money into our account and they'll notify us. Generally speaking they have a fee for this type of service but for this problem we're going to ignore that. There's no information about a fee. So what we have to do here is just treat this as information from the bank that now we have a new $1,000 deposit. So we'll call this bank collection for $1,000. Now we have a situation where the bank erroneously posted another company's check. In other words, they took money out of our account in the amount of $5,000. This was wrong on the bank side. So there's nothing we need to correct on our side. This is a flat out mistake that we'd want to notify our bank about. So it's an erroneous withdrawal. They took money out, so now we need to correct it by putting it back in. $5,000. Now interestingly, right next to that, we have the bank erroneously posted another company's deposit into our account in the amount of 3000 So this is the exact opposite of the erroneous withdrawal. They put money in that they shouldn't have, so now we have to take it back out. And finally, we have, after reconciling the bank statement, we noticed that a check that was written to pay for the current month's utilities in the amount of $250 was improperly recorded in our own books as 520 In other words, we put 200, uh, we charged our account 270 more than it should have been. The proper amount was 250. We put 270 more than that to get to the 520. So we need to, we, we took too much out of our own side. We need to add it back in for that $270. And we'll call that the utility check error. So now, let's take a look and see if everything works out right. 15,875, we're just going to add all of these cells because if they're, 
if they're uh, reductions, they already have a negative sign in front of them. So that one should be 67,800. And I know there are easier ways to do this in Excel. I'm just trying to show that we are indeed capturing everything. So fortunately, our two sides balance, which they should. If they don't, we know right away we have a problem. And we don't want to let it go because the longer the period of time, the harder it is to identify what the issue really was. So that is part one. That's the bank reconciliation itself. Part two is the set of adjusting entries that we need to perform. Now notice with the adjusting entries, we cannot do anything on the bank side. We can't go into the bank's records and change it. We At most we can notify them there's an error. With the book balance, we absolutely have to make the changes because nobody else will. Nobody else will have access to our account. So for these five items, we're going to need to make adjustments. So let's take a look at the first one. We had an NSF check for $500. So we know, first of all, and by the way, each of these have to impact cash. That's the whole point. So for A, we have to pull cash out of our account. So we know the credit has to be to cash right off the bat because we have less cash than we thought. That deposit for that one check is invalid. So it's a $500 amount. Now let's go take a look at the details again. This was an NSF check from Jay Smith. They wrote it on, they wrote it to pay off part of their account, but now we're saying it's invalid. We're going to have to put that right back on their accounts receivable. So we'll put that right back on their accounts receivable. We'll debit that to increase it, which tells them that they now still owe us that money. So $500 there as well. And let's see, the next one we had was the bank service charge for $50. So we know our amounts are going to be 50 It is using cash. So cash has to be credited. The debit, we're just going to call that service charge expenses. Interest earned for $125. Now in this case, we have more cash. So we're going to debit cash. The credit would go to actual interest revenue. We've earned more interest. Now we have the bank collection for $1,000. So first of all, we're collecting cash. And now this is, it's a collection on behalf of a customer. So they owed us money. They had an accounts receivable set up. Now we're crediting it to reduce it. They no longer owe us the money. Finally, we have the utility check error for $270. We had to add $270 in. Now, this was a utility amount due. So let's take a look at what examples we have. We have both utilities expense and utilities payable. Now, what would have happened here is that we would have, we would have, uh, recorded this initially as an expense, as a debit to utilities expense for too much money. So now we're having to credit utilities expense to reduce that amount by 270. And that takes us through part two of this bank reconciliation exercise. Hopefully this helps to clarify the concepts related to performing the bank reconciliation and doing any journal entries that are necessary. Thank you for your time.